we think about it, all the problems in the world happen in the absence of a great conversation. You yes. Know, political, social, economic, between partners, between lovers, you name it. Practically every problem happens because of the absence of a crucial conversation. So, but that takes courage because that means going off beast. That means, you know, we cannot just stick to our script. That means making space for things to go wrong. And we're not very good at that. We, we often play it safe. You know, we play it safe for many reasons. And of course, one of those reasons is that need to self-validate all the time. So you begin to see how, um, how uh, the self-worth piece is kind of fundamental for the, for the courageous conversation piece. I'm Talana Simpson, and this is Let's Talk Communication. Today in Let's Talk Communication, we are going to be talking about what for me and my guest today, John Nyland, the founder of the Self-Worth Academy, what we believe is the absolute foundation for us to have better and more courageous and more important conversations in this world. It is the, the way we define our sense of worth and value in how we are engaged with the world around us. John's organization focuses on promoting self-worth as the foundation of life and work. He is also the, an author and has written a book called The Courage to Ask, as well as one called The Self-Worth Safari, as well as a few other books. John, I've been very excited to, to get to speak to you some more today. So thank you so much for, for coming on Let's Talk Communication. Um, we're going to be exploring the whole concept about ourselves as in our self-worth, self-esteem, self-confidence, all of those concepts and how they relate to courage and communication. But maybe just to give us some, some background, can you tell us the story of how you got to be where you are today? Well, um, where do I start? The, um, the year that stands out in my own self-worth story was the year 2016. Uh, for me, that was a, a quite a, a pivotal year. Um, it had been a year of setbacks. Uh, it started, uh, well, it had the problems that already started in 2015 in that uh, it was the end of, a, 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 I was mourning the end of a romantic relationship. Uh, I had a business setback or two. Uh, we had Brexit here in the UK, which brought family consequences for me as a avowed European. Uh, it also brought economic consequences in terms of investments. It brought, uh, it also, uh, I've been very involved in a charity called Education for the Children in Guatemala, and it brought uh, funding consequences for that. And then while I was over there actually in Guatemala, uh, <clears throat> working with the foundation to deal with some of those issues, I got a message saying that my mother had had a, a heart attack and a stroke and three three weeks later she died. So the, the year of 2016 for me was like a, a succession of, of losses. And as, the, as that winter uh, arrived at the end of it, um, I really felt um, a, a loss of identity. Um, I had, despite the fact that I'd written several books and I was financially independent and, you know, I had what a, a lot of people were looking for in terms of, um, you know, in terms of self-identity or self-esteem, if we want to use that term, um, I, I, I wasn't feeling it. And, and to make matters worse, I was coaching other people you know, through my business coaching work and, and, and motivation and feeling a real sense of imposter syndrome. Um, because um, I, I had lost, you know, I had lost something about, about my relationship with myself. And my subsequent explorations led me to this distinction between self-worth and, and self-esteem, which ended up, I, I didn't realize it was going to, but it ended up in a book and it ended up in my changing direction um, and, and realizing how, um, you know, how much intrinsic self-worth uh, informs just about every aspect of, of life and work. So that's the short version. You can just imagine what the long version of that <laughs> looked like. Yeah. 
<laughs> oh, no, no, I can. So it, it has been quite a journey, yet what's come out of it is a very, very, sounds like a very clear distinction. Um, so, yeah, you promote what, um, you promote that self-worth as a foundation for life and work. Yeah. So it says, yeah. Well, the key distinction, I guess, is, is how we use the term self-worth, because certainly in English, uh, self-worth and self-esteem are used as synonyms for each other. So they're often, they're used interchangeably. Mm -hmm. um, but um, as I dug into the, uh, and, I, and I had known there was a distinction uh, at least two years earlier, but I was like a guy that was um, reading a recipe book, but not actually cooking the dish. You know, I intellectually knew there was a difference, um, but I wasn't mm -hmm. living that way. I was living very clearly on, on self-esteem, which is um, Nathaniel Brandon defined as our, our uh, reputation with ourselves. And my reputation with myself was very, very important to me. Um, I had, um, you know, I had I'd grown up that way. I had uh, internalized a belief system uh, around positive affirmations about myself. And the problem was that in 2016, I discovered they were great, but they just weren't great enough. You know, they, they uh, I needed something more unconditional. And, and self-worth is that unconditional loyalty to ourselves, no matter what is happening around us. So no matter what is happening in relationships, no matter what is happening in finance, no matter what is happening politically, no matter what is happening with the world, um, or, uh, you know, no matter what, what is happening uh, in the midst of a pandemic, and this is, of course, very relevant. Yeah. Um, no matter what is happening out there, we can still be unconditionally loyal to myself or to ourselves. And, and for me, this was the discovery of a lifetime. You know, I, it was like, I wish I'd known this 20, 30 years earlier. Yes. And, and in my work as well, I make such a, there's a strong for me di difference in these concepts, esteem, worth, um, confidence, you know, in relation to ourself. Yeah. And, and they are, they, um, they like foundational. But I just, just want to expand a bit more because I haven't used, heard that word loyalty being used so much. So we, you say self-worth is unconditional loyalty to yourself. What do you mean by loyalty then? Being unconditionally on our own side, no matter what. Uh, so let's take a fairly typical uh, scenario right now uh, in the economic crisis that surrounds the, the pandemic. Um, there's a lot of threat. There are people losing jobs. There are people who had a perfectly good revenue stream in their business this time last year, and woof, it's it's evaporated. That's like um, that's a worry. That's a, these are setbacks. Yes. Um, this is where the distinctions between self worth, self esteem, and indeed confidence um, become very relevant. Um, confidence is is how we portray ourselves. It's it's our uh, it's it's the performance that we uh, that we put on to the world. It can be real and of course it can be fake. Um, it's very hard to know from somebody's act whether they're being confident or not. You know, they're, a good performer will, will not let us know whether they are really feeling what they're, what they're pretending to be feeling. Um, Self-esteem self is our reputation with ourselves and of course we know that this goes up and down. As I discovered in 2016, it went way, went way, way down. But of course, it had always, and, and still does, uh, fluctuate. You know, on a good day, we you know sign up to new business and get some nice feedback from our partner, and you know, hey, the sun is out. It's it's yeah, it's, up. <laughs> it's easy. You know? um, but self worth is is that unconditional loyalty to ourselves even when we don't go to the gym as planned, even when we eat a bag of chips though we didn't plan to, even when we get rejected in, in work or in love, as the case may be, we can still be loyal to ourselves and not go into self-reproach, you know, blaming ourselves for where we're at or our position in life. Okay, so, so within that is the foundation or the, the defining in these, these terms. Um, what are your thoughts then on how we've previously been taught about in the past about self-esteem? Because it seems like there's been, a, there was, 
I'm currently exactly a decade or so ago, a, a growth in the world of psychology where they're trying to promote self-esteem and yet it's had the opposite effect of what they, everyone hoped. It's created a, a different um, people who, who feel entitled, who, who, I don't know, maybe you, you can help me, help me explain it a bit more, but what have you seen in terms of when you look back now with this distinction as, you know, the, the history of our um, fascination, I suppose, or focus on self-esteem in particular? Well, in the um, in the book, the self worth safari, I describe some of this. Um, I, it's not a history book. It, 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 it's actually a, a more of a uh, not even a psychology book. It is very much a, a book for somebody who wants to to deepen their sense of of self worth. I, I talk about the fact that self esteem for some was already a step up. You know, uh, I grew up with a very traditional, almost authoritarian. Uh, version of uh, of a religious upbringing. Now, self esteem was uh, was an improvement of that. You know, self esteem was um, at least uh, it allowed me to carve my own way to a certain extent. So I'm I'm not against self esteem, not at all. Uh, on the contrary, I think it's a uh, it's a really good thing, uh, and it's no accident that uh, it has been the dominant philosophy now for pretty much two generations of, of educators. Uh, we would all want our kids to grow up with self-esteem, wouldn't mm -hmm. we? Of course we would. The issue becomes, how is that based? On what is that founded? And here's where the problems begin. If self-esteem is founded on a, if it's rooted, so if we think, think of it as a plant, as again, I describe in the book, I, I use the metaphor as a, as a plant. If the, if the plant is, is, is in a very narrow pot called performance and called you know positive evaluation every day and being liked on social media you know these are this is like the this is a very narrow pot if the, if the plant is is rooted in a very narrow pot sooner or later it's going to wilt you know sooner or later some leaves are going to start falling off because it's going to outgrow its roots as happened in my case um, and what we want to do with self-worth is we want to take self-esteem and actually transplant it into uh, richer ground in, in which it can grow uh, sustainably and and that is the, that unconditional loyalty or unconditional friendship with ourselves that uh, I, I see as synonymous with the term uh, self-worth so um, indeed we have been educated that way um, and that's the problem. Uh, you touched on some of the issues. Uh, the biggest issue right now is anxiety. Uh, yes. Amongst the young, anxiety in particular is on the increase. Uh, it's in all the stats on addiction, on self-harm, on uh, even, in extreme cases, student suicide. Uh, in the UK alone, where I'm sitting, there are one, there is one student suicide every four days. Sure. And these are not students who are non-performing. They are students who are performing quite quite well. But, you know, when they get a B rather than, than an A, it's the end of their world. Mm. Uh, and, and this identification with self-assessment, uh, this way of performance-based self-esteem is what's literally killing people. Sure. So, so what then is a more empowering way for us to, to learn about and develop these aspects of ourselves? Because if we were to, to offer those, those youngsters that are having problems with all this anxiety, mm. what would be, be a, something, uh, you know? Well, uh, at, Southworth, at, the, at Southworth Academy, we do work with, with the young. Um, uh, to be honest, a lot of our work is with leaders and with entrepreneurs. Um, probably entrepreneurs being the single biggest group uh, because they're the people who can most quickly uh, you know, obtain the benefits, if you like. Uh, you know, if, if your self-worth is high, then uh, you can charge fees more confidently. You can set your prices. You can decide which clients you're working with and which you're not. Like it, it translates very quickly for an entrepreneur. For, for younger people, the, the principal interest, actually, for younger people is the sense of freedom that it gives. Uh, because uh, what is happening with the young is that they are feeling the burden of getting it right all the time. Mm -hmm. So just imagine you finished your primary degree 
uh, you're facing a crossroads. Do you go on to do masters and doctors? Do you go into a particular sector? Um, very often you're making uh, relationship decisions around the same time. And not everyone, but, but quite a few people are, as a lot of lifetime partnerships start in college, as they still do. So there's this burden to get it right. And you're constantly being told by, by lecturers and by teachers and probably your parents and some well-meaning friends that, you know, now is a very critical time in your life. You really have to make the right choices. Well, that's a huge weight for young people to carry. It's, it's literally the weight of the world's expectations uh, on, their, on their shoulders. And with self-worth and with understanding that, look, First and foremost, you can be a friend to yourself in all circumstances. Um, one of the very next thing most of them uh, conclude is that, hey, you know, the world isn't just going to be here for me this year. You know, I can make other decisions in other years. You know, I don't have to get it right all the time in order to be me. You know, there, there is a me beyond, beyond meeting these expectations. Um, so when young people do the self worth safari, which is, <clears throat> excuse me, the program that uh, that accompanies the book, um, the very first step is to make them aware of all of these assessments that they're making of themselves, both the positive and the negative ones. Because the positive ones are just as problematical. Uh, this is where the self worth approach is quite different to the self esteem approach. So self esteem approach will tell a young pe person replace the negative assessment with a positive assessment. So, you know, instead of saying, you know, I am stupid, you know, go in front of the mirror and say, I am smart. That, that's the, I'm being a little bit simplistic, but, but that is the- but It's the point, yeah. It's the point. I am smart, I am beautiful, you know, I am dot, dot, dot. The, we, the self-esteem culture encourages us to make these positive self-assessments. In the book, we discourage, and on the program that accompanies it for, for the young, we discourage people from making those assessments uh, because they're not necessary. You, you are fine already. There is, there is no need to be making neither the, the negative nor the positive assessments. In, in many ways, the positive assessments reinforce the addiction. So yeah. we get them journaling, we get them writing down and, 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 and taking stock of, you know, why, why do you need to make all these assessments of yourself? What's going on? And for many, it's like, wow, you know, they, they kind of keep up. They will, they will try to journal this for a day or two and then they will invariably stop after about two days because it's impossible to keep up with all the uh, self-assessment that, that is going on. You must remember in educational institutions, they're being assessed to death all the time. Yes, yes. It's set up to, to say that you, know, that you have to always compare yourself to someone else. Exactly. There's a top of the class and exactly. if you're not there, there's something wrong with you. That's right. That's yeah. right. You know, they are being assessed every hour of their lives. So, so that's something a lot around our, so when you, you talk about self-esteem as being the reputation of ourself, it's, our reputation then is based on performance. Yes. We have to perform and if we perform well, then we have a good reputation and then we'll be liked, we will be accepted, whatever. If we don't perform well or we're not pretty or we, you know, we, all yep. those negative things, then there, there's something wrong. Well, Which, not only that, but in today's culture, you have to be outstanding. I mean, it's not just enough to be good. Yes. <laughs> you know, they, again, let's look at it through the eyes of the young. They are on their social media. They're seeing pictures of people climbing mountains and buying dream cars and getting engaged and, you know, looking. And having the perfect skin, yeah. Having the perfect skin. I mean, for women, it's even worse. Um Although it's actually getting pretty bad for men as well. Uh, the, 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 the gender gap is actually catching up on self-image. Um, young men now feel almost under the same pressure, uh, except it's about muscles and it's about, you know, it's a different yes. look. But it, uh, the pressure is on. Um, and, um, and those who do not feel that they are living up to those expectations um, very quickly can feel a sense of failure. So then your, your self with Safari is getting people to then rather be friends with themselves and, and stop the evaluation of themselves, living, trying to live up to expectations or 
measuring themselves the whole time and rather? So the, the first shift is to notice the assessments and actually start replacing them with actions, actions of self-care. You know, so rather than doing an assessment, you know, of any kind, just go and drink some water. You know, it doesn't have to be a big action. It can be, a, it can be any small action of, of self-care. Um, just before this call, in order to just uh, keep my mind fresh and so on, um, it's, it's afternoon here. Um, <clears throat> I went for a walk out the garden. Uh, I'm staying at my daughter's and I just went for a walk out the garden. I pulled some vegetables that I'd grown earlier in the week and I, I just took 10 minutes to have a break. You know, that's yeah. an act of self-care. It's, it's not done to prove anything. It's just an act of taking care of myself. And it, it takes 10 minutes. Um, the second shift then, and this is a, quite an important one in, in the overall scheme of things, is to change our intent, to change the, the focus with which we do things. And if I take the example of going to the gym, uh, that will that will do. But uh, this could easily be at work. Uh, this could be about yes. doing a presentation as well, or doing a sales meeting for entrepreneurs. And that is, what's your intention as you go through the door? Um, are you going out in order to prove something to yourself, or are you going out as, to take care of yourself? In other words, in in the book, it's described as mm -hmm. from condition to expression. So instead of placing another condition on our self-esteem, like I'm doing this yoga class so that I will look good, or I'm doing this, uh, I'm going to the gym in order to lose weight condition. Um, yeah, can we do it instead as an expression of, of, a, of a friendship with ourselves that's already there? So rather than chasing something that's not yet established, you know, condition, we instead shift to expression. We still do the self-care action, but we do it from a radically different place. Yes. And this changes literally everything. It changes how we deal with clients. It changes how we do meetings. It changes our experience of going to the gym. It changes how we go for a run. It changes how we date. Uh, yes. it, it, there's almost no aspect of life that this doesn't begin to uh, make a change. And others can sense the change. Uh, don't ask me how. I have no idea. Um, but client or prospective clients can pick up on the fact that your intention is to be useful to them rather than just to impress them. Mm. It, it, it's like energetically or somehow. I, I've, I've no, I cannot explain it. But within minutes, a person can feel what our intention is. Are we trying to get validation? <laughs> or are we really there for them? It's extraordinary. It is. It, it, it is. And it's such a, that's why I think we both said it's, it's the foundation of so much. Because you. it's actually literally the, the place you live in. It's where you start from. It's how you engage with the world. Yep. And through that, every engagement then is influenced by that, that intention to express or to, yeah. or to what's the other one? Well, I love the way you just put it. It's how we engage with the world. Yeah. I think that's, that's beautifully, that's a beautiful summary. That's exactly what it is. So, so then how, and this is something I just want to add. I was going to ask how it relates then our two to our emotions, our emotional intelligence. And, and even like what that, that concept means to you? Well, uh, um, obviously, this is a, emotional Another. intelligence is a huge subject. <laughs> um, and obviously, fundamental to emotional intelligence is self-awareness. As you know, any book on emotional intelligence will uh, describe, um, you know, chapter one is about developing, uh, developing self-awareness. Um, and uh, I mean, there's a lot of people with how, who are self-esteem based who do have high self-awareness. So we're we're not saying I'm not saying for a moment that self-worth has a monopoly on self-awareness. No, it doesn't. There are there are many worthy routes to to self-awareness um, and to living consciously with uh, with ourselves. Um, and definitely, self-worth is one way of doing it, and it's not the only way. Uh, I think yeah. that's important to say. Um, there is. However, um, somewhere down the way, there's a fork on the road, which is why are we doing what we're doing? You know, what's our sense of purpose?
behind all of this? Um, are we doing it in our endless search for validation? And there's many people on conscious journeys right now and on even very high self-aware and emotional intelligence journeys at the moment who are still doing it in pursuit of the optimum self, a phrase that I passionately detest <laughs> because of the performance um, yeah. thinking embedded in it. Uh, and this optimized self culture is, create, is writing a blank check for a lot of depression, a lot of narcissism, a lot of insecurity. So um, it's, you know, I'm not suggesting that self-worth is the, is the entire basis of, of, uh, of self-awareness or emotional intelligence. I, I, I don't believe it is. But if you don't have it, if you don't find your way around to self-worth in one form or another, and it took me quite a long time or before I discovered it, then sooner or later there's a price to pay. Yeah. So, so part then of it being emotionally intelligent is having that self awareness, be living consciously. I wanted to just touch again on what you mean by that, because is is it about? that consciously deciding every day I'm going to live intentionally from this place of, of unconditional loyalty to myself. Exactly. Uh, you, you've and nailed it. Precisely that. It's the, you know, I'm going to go out for, you know, so one of the exercises, there's a, there's a morning routine in the book. And uh, one of the exercises in the morning routine is as your feet touch the floor in the morning, uh, affirm your friendship with yourself. It takes seconds. Like, but yeah. as the feet touch the floor, let everything that happens for the rest of the day in some way or other be uh, an expression, not a condition, <laughs> be an expression of, of your self-worth. So, you know, you go to a client, the client isn't very happy with how the project's going. Okay, how can I be useful? Not, it wasn't my fault. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. uh, you come home. Uh, you've forgotten the shopping. Your partner says, where's the shopping? You go, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, now, how can I make amends? Uh, how do I deal with that? Do I order a takeaway? Do I do some cooking? You know, do I take you out to dinner? Or what do I do? But not going into a drama of, yeah, but I can't think of this as well as do my day's work. You know, I got the shopping yesterday and all of that stuff, which is just drama drama <laughs> um, it did self-worth means we're not chasing validation all the time and that one of the con one of the immediate benefits that that has is it frees up our energy uh, to be available to our colleagues to be available in families to, to show up and, and to contribute to society yeah. rather than just seeing society as a vehicle to reflect back my own glory yeah, very much. And it sounds like another another benefit you, you've touched on a few times is also our relationship then to failure. Yes. Because, yes. oh, you know, it's like I made a mistake. I forgot the shopping. Yeah. Sorry, let's fix it. Kind of let's, yeah. well, what else can we do about it? Versus yeah. um, I am a failure. Indeed. Like failure is a fact of life. You know, I'm an, I'm an entrepreneur. You know that what that means? It means that nine things I try don't work. <laughs> one out of ten does <laughs> so I've, I've written about and this before in, in, in a book called The Courage to Ask which was the previous book about eight years ago I've, I've written a lot about this about failure and our relationship with risk uh, for example that you know courage is not the absence of fear uh, or it's not the absence of uh, in this case the, of not the absence of failure there will be plenty of fear and there will be plenty of failure um, but courage is about uh, adopting a different attitude towards that uh, and self-worth enables us to do this. So if, if we think of self-worth as an enabler of courage, uh, it really is. Mm -hmm. Because it, it no longer matters that we fail from time to time. In fact, as an entrepreneur, you, unless you're spectacularly lucky, uh, then uh, you get to uh, develop a very close relationship with failure uh, along the way. 
um, hopefully not business failure, but it, you know, not every client signs up, not every business proposition turns out to be what it says on the tin, not every potential partner turns out to really be a partner, um, not every staff member works out. Uh, you know, that's as anyone who's been in business or management for any length of time will know. Um, there is no certainty except death and taxes, and uh, the uh, uh, and hence failure is a fact of life. What self worth does is it helps us to recover from these setbacks much more quickly. Yeah, uh, and that's uh, so. If energy is one of the first benefits that many people have, uh, resilience or or you know, swift recovery usually follows pretty quickly. So let's say you go to give a presentation or do a proposal uh, or do an interview and you don't, get the, you don't get the gig. So the person who is self-esteem driven now has two problems. One, they didn't get the gig, the situation, but now they have this whole, what does that say about me thing going on? Yes. You know, am I not good enough? Did I not come across as charismatic enough? Oh, I need to be more X, whatever X is. Um, for many, it's about their physique, which creates some very difficult challenges, um, some of which can't even be spoken about in today's culture. Uh, you know, there's a whole range of, of issues that people can feel when they're rejected for whatever reason. The self-worth person goes home, same experience. They've also got the pain of rejection. That's not nice. However, here's the difference. They don't go into that second tier of self-reproach. They don't need to. They know they're okay in the first place. Yeah, they may well have to improve their skills. They may well have to lose some weight. They may well have to do whatever it is they need to do. Fine. Uh, it's there as an option. They don't even need to. It's, it's, it's a choice. It's something they could do if they want, if they choose, but they're still in charge. So yeah. therefore, their recovery, far from taking weeks or months or sometimes years, you know, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. In my coaching work, I, I come across people who decades later are still enacting and reacting to a narrative that happened with their first boss 20 years earlier. Yeah. They were unfairly judged about something and they spend the rest of their career proving that he was wrong or she was wrong. Uh, so that there are people who take incredibly long periods of time to recover from, from things that can be recovered from in a day or two, or maybe even an hour or two with self-worth. So, so then yeah, if I have to summarize what I'm hearing is some of the benefits of coming from this unconditional self-worth that we're talking about. One is you it's easier to gain more awareness of yourself, which helps with the emotional intelligence and all that. You have way more energy because now your energy is not going into proving it's going into expressing and you can bounce back way quicker from, from setbacks and failures, just how you learn. It's just part of life. Yeah. Is there any other benefits? Ooh, lots. How long have we got? Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, a very relevant one right now is how we deal with change and uncertainty. Mm. Change and uncertainty produces a lot of anxiety. Uh, well, for everybody, uh, produces. Uh, you know, right now we're we're seeing it. You know, people don't know what the next six months to twelve months are going to look like. Uh, we don't know. You know, we yeah. don't. We don't even know if we're going to be here. You know, that's the, this is. You know, existential, um, and it's certainly existential in economic terms. Uh, so we're we're all facing into one of the most uncertain uh, periods of time that the world has seen for for a long period of time. Now, when people are sailing into that uh, world of uncertainty and uh, potential risk and and threat, uh, then it makes the world a difference what a person's relationship with themselves is. Uh, and I saw that very vividly illustrated uh, last week. Um, and I'll be careful of, of confidentiality here because I don't want to betray who the, who the person is. But uh, I saw someone whose, whose colleague uh, was diagnosed with COVID-19. 
And while they were waiting for the results, A, for the colleague, and secondly, to know whether they themselves had been infected, they uh, became very, very stressed. And they ended up having, you know, borderline ruinous arguments with at least three other people in the course of one single week. Uh, you know, burning, in many cases, months and possibly years of relationships inside a very, very short few hours by the way they were reacting to this piece of uncertainty that was mm -hmm. out there. So, you know, fear and, uh, and, and people's reaction to, uh, to uncertainty often brings very practical consequences to relationships. If somebody has self-worth, <clears throat> then they're going to have a lot less of that anxiety for all the reasons already discussed. Their, their relationship with themselves is rock solid, no matter what is going on around them. They're not dependent on the world to give them that sense of self-identity. Uh, I know this because I used to be that person <laughs> who was dependent on the world to give me self-identity. So an economic threat, for example, would be personal. A political threat would be personal. A financial threat would be personal because it would be, who will I be? How will I cope? Um, with self-worth, I've personally experienced how, um, you know, during the during a pandemic, for example, our minds turn instead to how can we be useful to other people during times of, uh, of uncertainty. And in our business, as and it will come, I'm pretty sure the same might be true for you, Talana. Um, in uh, certainly in the in at Self Worth Academy, we've seen an explosion in inquiries and in business ever since the pandemic started. Um, partly because of the field we're in, but I think most of all because we've done things that we see to be useful to people, or we've tried to be useful to people. Um, or and or um, we have allowed them to tell us what would be more useful. Now, so this is the um, the beauty of um, self worth during times of uncertainty. It actually allows us to turn our thoughts to how we can be useful during those times, rather than how will I cope, or who will I be, as the case may be. Yeah, and all the, all the fear of who you who you are would could be influenced or is influenced yes. by, by the today's yes. world. Indeed. So I think this is, because um, that was what I want to ask you is why it's so important in today's Corona world. But I think you've just explained it. It gives us um, way more resilience and ability to, to add value instead of, exactly. of, exactly. of <clears throat> worrying too much about it. But then, what about um, also in countries like mine? So South Africa is very much a fear-based society. So besides just the, the coronavirus, we have a lot of violence in our country. We have a lot of crime. It's, yep. We've come from a very violent background. Mm -hmm. um, why, why would self-worth then be relevant to, to like a country like mine? Well, South Africa. The, the, um, the, there's an additional um, benefit, I think, or additional relevance of self-worth whenever people are recovering from trauma. Um, and it's not just individuals who have trauma, entire societies do. Um, you know, I know this, I grew up in Ireland, which, you know, as an island has been traumatized by, uh, you know, centuries of, of violence and poverty and, and deprivation. I've worked in Guatemala. I've seen exactly the same, uh, the same characteristics emerge. Uh, when you're dealing with generations of empowerment, uh, sorry, when you're dealing with generations of disempowerment that go back a long, long time, when you're dealing with violence, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, existential threat being real, you know, where the death of where death by starvation is not just a, you know an abstract threat, but actually you know people know people who have died of it. Um, reality. And, yeah, it's reality, and it's reality that's often handed down from one generation to the next. So, you know, if you are the uh, if if you were brought up by a survivor, then you know what it's like to have a survivor as a parent. 
know, and, and survivors are, you know, great parents in some ways, but boy, they can be very disempowering to self-worth. Uh, and they do not have, and nor did they bring up kids, with a sense of deserving. So arriving at any kind of sense of deserving, if you if you have this in the history or if you have this in the culture, is is already it's it's like turning up in a beautiful sunlit valley that you never knew was there. Uh, and the experience most of us had, and you notice I said us, that certainly includes me, is that we just didn't believe it was real. You know, when I first came across the literature of self-compassion, of um, you know, uh, self-love, etc., I just felt this was, you know, the writings of privilege that it had no relevance to me. Uh, and I'm sure there must be many people in war-torn societies and in all manner of societies uh, who believe that a lot of what does the rounds of personal development is a privilege of the middle class or a privilege for other people, but somehow doesn't apply. Um, you know, when uh, when I have honest conversations with people about, do you really deserve to be happy? You'd be astonished at the number of people who don't actually believe that they are deserving. Yeah. You know, so this whole thing about because I'm worth it, which is a mantra that runs quite <laughs> regularly through this book, um, I know from from working with many people that um, it takes some people quite a while to arrive there. And particularly if they've survived childhood abuse, if they've survived uh, uh, violent parents, authoritarian figures, you know, not everyone grows up with a sense of deserving. And therefore, what self-worth does is that it allows them over time to reparent themselves a bit again through this intrinsic kindness towards oneself. So yeah, so it sounds like it's very important. Very important concept to get out into more cultures, into more spaces. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. We think so. Uh, I think so too. <laughs> um, so we spoke a little bit about our current context within the whole world, the Corona world, and then about you know my country, South Africa. And I know you've you've mentioned a bit about businesses and leaders. Um, it's obviously, as we said, it's a it's a understanding this this distinction of self-worth and self-esteem and choosing to come from the unconditional you know having that intention unconditional self-worth to express yourself in the world gives you the benefits of self-awareness more energy resilience um, able to handle change um, far far easier so then is there anything else in terms of business or leadership that, that you want to mention then that, that this concept of self-worth is, would be very beneficial or why leaders should even know about it? Because it's, it's often a, like a term that's not brought into the corporate world. No, indeed. It's, very true. You know, let, very few people want to touch on self-esteem, never mind self-worth. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would often just remind any leader or manager What's it like to manage people who have low self-worth? You know, what's it, what's it going to cost you to manage people who have low self-worth? Yet they'll be running to you all the time trying to prove themselves. They'll be, they'll find it impossible to admit to mistakes. Uh, you know, you will have to put in another level of management to cope with all the game playing that you don't want to cope with. Like the costs of managing people with low self-worth is pretty high. Yeah. Many of them will be manipulative. Some of them will run away with information or relationships from the business. Uh, so, you know, ignoring self-worth can be very, very costly. Uh, so when we work with leaders, we uh, work with them on a number of fronts. One is, uh, wherever possible, hire people who have high self-worth rather than low self-worth. And then we talk to them a little bit about how they can do that. The uh, second thing is, you know, if you want to be a really empowering leader, then, you know, if you can work with your teams so that they are developing while they're, while they're with you, so that they feel that they are developing their own relationship with themselves while they're coming to work. This is very relevant right now with homeworking. A lot of people cannot do the usual things about getting together. Uh, so it becomes doubly important to give people a good sense of themselves. 
to, to educate them a little bit that that's that's for them to develop. Because the beauty about self worth is, you know, <laughs> this is something you have already. You you discover it rather than develop it. Uh, you've already got it. Uh, so when they uh, actually work with people to discover well, what they already have, i.e. self-worth, then a lot of the engagement uh, and a lot of the benefits that flow from that get, get to be a lot easier. Third benefit is creativity. Uh, when people have self-worth, they become more creative uh, because they're not using up the, the energy that is constantly being used up in self-validation is free. So, mm. when, they, so when, they are, when they have self-worth, they can go, hmm, what would happen if we did uh, mastermind groups rather than dot, dot, dot. You know, they're, they're, they become curious about uh, the world around them. Uh, they begin to put, uh, to join up things that have not been joined up before. Um, and, and that's the essence of creativity, making fresh connections. Very useful. So then you touched a bit there on, about the leaders then having the conversations or, or sounds like it would involve having conversations around these terms. And that's why, you know, part of what this, this podcast is about, what I really find important is having those really meaningful conversations that shift things and that. So um, did maybe, you know, touch a bit on that is, um, I know, I know from your, your previous book, the, the courage to ask mm -hmm. with, with Kate Daly that you wrote with her, um, there's a lot there around um, having the courage to ask, which is, which is a uh, conversation. Yep. Um, so, so I don't know if you wanted to share, like how, how does self-worth and courage then, which comes from self-worth, help us have those difficult conversations? Indeed. <clears throat> um, so let's just talk about conversations first, and then I'll come back to, to self-worth. I, I love your focus on conversation in your work. It's one of the things that uh, uh, that, that really stood out you know, while I was uh, reading your, your website and your blog in particular uh, on communication, Thanks. and particularly courageous communication. Uh, because if we think about it, all the problems in the world happen in the absence of a great conversation. Yes. You know, political, social, economic, between partners, between lovers, you name it. Practically every problem happens because of the absence of a crucial conversation at some point, beginning, middle, or end. Um, and so many problems can and, can and are solved, uh, even at country level, when leaders have the right conversations. So, but that takes courage because that means going off piste. That means, you know, we cannot just stick to our script. That means making space for things to go wrong, as in our earlier conversation. And we're not very good at that. We, we often play it safe. You know, we play it safe for many reasons. And, of course, one of those reasons is that need to self-validate all the time. So you begin to see how... Um, how uh, the self-worth piece is kind of fundamental for the for the courageous conversation piece. Um, I didn't fully grasp that uh, eight years ago when I wrote the book, uh, The Courage to Ask. I didn't fully grasp the significance of self-worth as, as a, an essential foundation for courageous conversations to take place. Um, it's very hard to have a courageous conversation if the two people involved are desperately trying to prove themselves right. Yes. You know, and if they desperately need to prove themselves right because of their own incessant hunger, or if if they're feeding the void inside for validation, that's you know that's always hungry, that's never fulfilled, then it's going to be really hard, no matter how good the, no matter how good the tactics and the practices are, whether borrowed from this book or any other book, um, the, you know, the, then in the end that 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 hunger will will somehow uh, spill into the uh, to the conversation. So to have courageous conversations, I think we first have to make ourselves okay with ourselves. Mm. That's, that inner conversation needs to be solid. Uh, then we're in a better position to go off piste a little bit to ask, okay, what would have been better rather than react at 
what the other person says. To start a business meeting with what would be most useful today, rather than just slavishly following the agenda that we put together last week. To um, give honest feedback to an alliance partner who is not pulling their weight and who needs to be told they're not pulling their weight because otherwise if we just drop them and find somebody else they've got no opportunity to put it right like that's courage yes so then then we we it starts with that being right to ourselves as you're saying being okay with who we are and i think part of that as we said also being okay with mistakes because that's part of you know i may have said the wrong thing so let's just talk about it a bit and um, yeah, I'm not trying to prove, but trying to listen to hear the other person um, and to have the courage then to say what needs to be said, to focus on it. Um, so is there anything else? Maybe we could, you could share with us a time that you had a, one of those courageous conversations or conversation that counted. Um, you don't have to go into obviously too many details, but it's just to to share what you can, and then like what worked, what helped you have that that conversation. Or you... yeah. well, particularly when I was younger, I was always very guarded in the conversations that I had. I, I had gone to boarding school. I had learned the survivor's instinct for just being very careful about what you shared with with people. So I was, you know, doing anything like, uh, I wasn't doing anything like courageous conversations. Uh, On the contrary, I was having very, very carefully managed conversations with people. Um, Unless when I lost my temper or something, and then it was like, boom. (laughs) But um, I remember I had, um, around the time of the millennium, um, I at that point had an IT business, which was quite successful. uh, at the time of the, the story, and um, but I had I I bricked myself into it, you know I, I just couldn't uh, escape, and I I felt that um, I wanted to do something else. Uh, I didn't know what I didn't even know coaching existed uh, at this time. Uh, far less uh, had come across it. I was actually going to do a, a degree in economics and, and popular culture because it seemed to me that was the uh, it was the, the confluence of these things that had defined where we were in the year two thousand. So I was full of this agonizing about, yeah, but what about the team and what do we do with the business and, you know, all of this stuff. And I went for dinner with a friend who, he wasn't even a very close friend, actually. And, and that possibly that was significant because I, I felt safe enough to share my dilemma with him. And he wasn't in my world. He wasn't in the IT world. I felt there was no risk here of anything mm-hmm. going wrong. So I was a bit more courageous than I usually it was and divulged everything about what I was feeling about this sense of being trapped in my own business you know that I remember saying to him it's as if I designed this house and I forgot to put a door in it so I cannot get out you know and um, we had just tried a trade sale and that had that had flopped it had not gone through uh, so it was like oh my god I'm going to be I'm going to be in this forever you know and I, I, I was telling him all this and he sat over dinner and he listened uh, for throughout this entire conversation and about this decision that I, you know, wanted to make. And when the dessert was served, he said, John, I've only got one comment to make. He says, it seems to me you've already made your decision. You talked to me about a decision that you're, that you want to make, but from listening to you for the last, whatever, hour, (laughs) poor man, (laughs) um, uh, it seems to me that you've already made a decision. And I went home that night and I, I didn't sleep all night, you know, because I realized he'd hit the nail on the head. I had already decided. I just didn't know how and where and how it was going to happen. But I had already decided what was going to happen. I was just in denial with myself about something I had already decided. Decide. It was, um, you know, we kept contact for many years after, but we have recently lost contact. Now. We, we uh, at least 10 years ago, that lost contact um, but it was one of the most influential conversations ever uh, in the course of my life and it wasn't that he said a lot um, but he just made one very pertinent observation on what I had been sharing with him 
Uh, and of course, it's changed everything, you know, because a yeah. month later, two and six weeks later, we'd organized a management buyout. The uh, IT business was moved on. I started doing the master's and discovered this wasn't at all what I was expecting to be studying. So, um, <laughs> and I accidentally discovered coaching and well, the rest is history. But um, this is 20, just over 20 years ago. Uh, but it was a life-changing conversation. So, and what I'm hearing then that, that helped to have that conversation, one was the, there was a level of safety with yes. the person you were, were with and it was probably the setting um, that allowed you to be courageous enough to actually then say what you need, what you were feeling, yep. actually express what was going on inside your thinking, your feeling yep. and that, and then having someone in the, in that conversation that listened, but Sounds like that person really listened really to give did. you the space to, to speak, yep. but as well as to then be able to reflect back the, the key piece. Yep, exactly. Exactly. And he had no specialist knowledge of my business or my anything. You know, he, was, uh, mm. he had nothing to do with business at all. He was director of the local gallery, you know, it, it, but it was based precisely on, on what you described, the safety uh, and the listening. Yeah. If, if without that listening, real authentic listening, um, he couldn't have given me the feedback that he did. So, so to bring the, those concepts in terms of having those courageous conversations back then to start with, that's where I think why we, we both feel it's so fundamental. When you come from that place of unconditional self-loyalty to self, self-worth, versus the self-esteem mm. that you're talking about, the... Um, you actually, it's easier also to be with another and hear them. Yes. It's much yes. easier to, because then you know, it's not about you thinking of where am I going to like say my next point to prove right. that I'm just as good as him or her. It's like, let me hear this human being. They're busy expressing themselves. Let me just listen. Yeah. And the opposite of that, and very often the easiest way to see something is see it from both sides. The opposite experience was during 2016 when I was having this very dark, uh, you know, I didn't even know what the problem was. You know, I was, uh, I was really struggling. And now, you know, uh, this is what, 16 years later, the, the earlier, the, sorry, 16 years after the first conversation that I've just described. Um, and, and now I'm, I'm the opposite. I'm quite happy to talk to anybody who is, uh, who is listening. You know, I, I'm, I'm not guarded at all. In fact, I sometimes wonder <laughs> if I haven't actually gone the other way. Um, and um, and hopefully be there for that too. After all, this is my, my day job. It involves a lot of listening. Um, but when I went to various coaches and people in the personal development world with some of my challenges of 2016, I felt that they were listening in order to reply, as you've just described. They were listening to say the next clever thing or to ask that question they just learned in a coaching workshop. And none of this worked. In fact, I remember getting quite annoyed with one guy going, can I just talk to you man to man here rather than you trying to coach me? You know? <laughs> that, precisely because it was missing that understanding and it was yeah. missing the depth of listening. I felt that people were trying to practice their skills on me. And, uh, you know, I could feel it. Yeah, that's a very interesting observation of our, of our industry. And I think, that, so that's why I think the, the key to this is, is we as individuals need to work on our own self-worth. So, so develop intellectually and then feeling it, I think is also part of your journey is, intellectually understanding the concept and then actually living it, feeling yeah. it and deciding every day, as you say, as you get out of bed, putting yeah. your slippers on, yeah. today I'm going to be loyal, a friend to myself, and this is how I choose. I'm going to express yeah. who I am in, in the world. Because once we've got that, it's, it's much easier then to help other people also. Sure. So experience that and maybe you know it's partly them experiencing it in another that allows it opens it for them yeah. Yeah. but also then even as leaders if we bring it back to you know the business world um or in your family yep. 
we can be an example of it and help others and hopefully have way more courageous conversations. Indeed. Indeed. And for that reason, we're planning right now a self-worth week where we're going to have lots of international speakers and people who are coming from different continents. Oh, it'll all be on Zoom uh, or something like Zoom. Yes, we yes. Haven't, we've still worked out the, the details of it, but precisely so that we can have groups for entrepreneurs, groups work for people working with the young uh, coaches and therapists wishing to bring it into one-on-one -on -one practice. Uh, but above all, just um, people sharing the various gifts and talents that they've got. Uh, we're planning this self-worth week, which hopefully by the time your, uh, your interview is ready, we, we should have a link for. Um, but um, we plan to do one every year. So we'll have a, a yearly roundup from people from the many people we're working with in different continents on this, um, because as you said earlier, it really is a time that that uh, not just leaders, but but many young people and those working with the young, uh, we would we'd like them to be to be more versed on this difference between self worth and self esteem. So how can people get hold of you then? So that I'll, I'll obviously when you let me know, I'll put the information in you know my right. blogs and and all of that. But how can people get hold of you? So in the meantime, it's selfworthacademy.com. Uh, so there's a team there on the team page. Uh, I think all of our email addresses are on it. I am john at selfworthacademy.com. We are about 20 associates at the moment working in different, uh, I was going to say countries, but it's now continents. Um, <laughs> it's still quite young for us. The book was published, uh, the book, The Self Worth Safari, was published in the uh, beginning of 2019. So we're still in the second year of our uh, of our existence. Uh, but the pandemic has actually uh, almost uh, lit the fire, uh, if you like, uh, because suddenly the relevance of self-worth uh, to our uncertain world uh, has actually uh, seems to have cottoned on, shall we say. Yes, uh, so, yes. Selfworthacademy.com and obviously as the Selfworth week becomes uh, uh, becomes a little bit further on in its planning, it will have its own website with all the different contributors uh, featuring on it. Super, I look, I look forward to that. So, so to wrap up then, I always ask is is there a conversation that you believe we need to be having more of today that would make a world a better place? Yeah, I um, will come back to the usefulness question. Um, I think uh, genuinely, uh, and I don't mean using this as a sales technique or a marketing technique or whatever, but genuinely asking more people every day, um, what would you find most useful right now? I think that is an exploratory question, uh, is a great way of building relationships. I think it's a great way of promoting understanding. Uh, I think it's a great way of stopping a lot of the self-presentation that frankly is just going nowhere a lot of the time. Um, it is a way in which we learn what we need to learn uh, about where there are needs in the mm. in the world, and um, and I think for those who are isolated behind screens in lockdown, whether they be business owners or whether they be leaders or um, educators, whoever they may be, um, I think it gives them a chance to be really genuinely heard. Mm. Do you have any other closing thoughts you'd like to share? Well, you know, the closing thoughts I'm sure to have after we <laughs> end the call, you know, that's uh, Murphy's Law, isn't it? <laughs> um, I guess the, um, the um, one of my favorite quotes is, the, uh, is a T.S. Eliot quote that's right at the front of the book. Uh, and it comes from a poem called The Self Unseen which is quite extraordinary, it was written, you know, uh, over a hundred years ago. Um, and he says, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the very first time. And I often think that sums up the adventure that we're engaged in. You know, it's not that we go to somewhere exotic way out there where we've never been before. But what, ha what happens for many of us is we come back to where we started, but 
we suddenly see it with fresh eyes and we know the place for the very first time. Mm. It's lovely to, uh, to know ourselves and our words. Yeah, indeed. Well, thank you very much, John. Thanks, Delana. It's been a pleasure. To find out more information about my guest, John Nyland, and the Self-Worth Safari, as well as this podcast, you can go to my website, innercoaching.co.za forward slash talk communication. And with that, I hope that you really got to, to get a sense of the, the distinction that John is making between self-worth and self-esteem and the unconditional part. It's very much um, a core foundation in the work I do. And it's a message that it's, I know from so much experience that it's, it really does change and shifts everything um, in the most positive and constructive way. So I hope you go now and find a way to be unconditionally loyal to yourself and go and have some more courageous conversations. Thank you for listening.